Good evening. Thanks for coming. I'm, we are incredibly grateful that you took time of all the things that you could do for the, for the Saturday Night at Academy, and you came out to see our presentation. My name is Michael Singer, and we're going to talk to you today about DME in the real world, past, present, and future. These are both great questions, but I'm going to get you a little further along. You're kind of jumping the gun. We're going to talk about, because one of the things that's really interesting, and I'll start from here, is CNU set the stage. Well, it was good. CNU set the stage, which was wonderful. And you all got to eat, which is also wonderful. So I knew you didn't have to ask lots of questions. I have the other thought is now that you actually have food in your stomach and you can keep your hands together, I'm sure I'm going to get more questions going forward. But one of the things I want to bring your attention to really quickly, one slide that Cena showed you really was interesting. When he showed you the slide that looked at the anti-VEGF trials and he showed you the fact that if, you know, the high burden of treatment. There were two other trials on that. One was the RESTORE trial, and obviously as we started treating people with PRN therapy, that's a real life trial, like you treat people, the vision went down. So again, the take home message that I want you to think of when you think of anti-VEGF is basically, you, in order to get the great vision, you gotta keep giving shots over and over again. And there'll be analysis, I think Szilard may have some of those analysis as well, the more shots you give, the better off the vision is. So one of the things, so Sinus set the stage, and thank you for doing such a spectacular job. I'm going to take you to the next step. So the next step we're going to talk about is that's what you know, right? That, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this audience has heard some of these trials I mean, over time because that's what got the medicines approved. Those were the things that, you know, we ran clinical trials. Clinical trials are based on concepts that patients have to go and come in every month based on a criteria, and you've got coordinators that co them. You've got patients that are motivated. That's as good as you can be, okay? So let's see what happens in real life. So my job is to talk about a real-life story, which is a phase four clinical trial. First clinical trial we're going to talk about is Ozerdex. So let me give you a little historical backstory. The Mead study that, that CNU was so eloquently presented started in 2003, and it didn't finish ten, until 10 years later. So essentially, it was very hard to recruit, and when they initially designed the trials, and everybody on this panel has helped design some of the clinical trials that you've heard about, read about, and gone forward, which is why I have such a wonderful, illustrious panel, we do things based on what we know at the time. But as you all know, times have changed. So the reality is by the time the Mead study came out, we realized from studies like Geneva and Shasta that Ozerdex was used differently in real life, and basically the Mead study was based on every six months. So the Reinforce study, which we're going to talk about now, was a multi-center trial done using patients in private practice. And the private practice not being private or university, but non-clinical trial. So basically, we know dexamethasone works. It has, it's very good at controlling swelling and uveitis. I mean, uveitis retinal vein occlusion, and DME, but we wanted to see what happens in the real world, so we wanted to assess the safety and efficacy of real-world use of dexamethasone in DME. It was a prospective multi-center trial, but it was an observational registry trial. So basically what they did was, you didn't have to have a protocol, they looked on how did you deal with it in real life. So what they did was they, they captured data on your history, they captured data on assessments, and they started the clock when you gave the first Ozerdex. And once you gave the first Ozerdex, they watched it forward for about a year, and what they did was they looked at the visual acuity. Typically, when you do clinical trials, you do EDTRS visual acuity. Well, in real life, you don't use EDTRS visual acuity, you use Snellen visual acuity. So we took the Snellen visual acuity and we converted it into EDTRS. What was the primary endpoint? The primary endpoint was the maximum best corrected change in visual acuity after each DEX injection. And sec also, as percentage of patients were 15 letter gainers. And the reason 15 letters is such a big deal is it's a clinically meaningful change in your vision. And really quickly, just to give you a quick part of a backstory, essentially, um, I asked the head of the FDA why he cared about 15 letter gains. And he said, Michael, this is clinically re relevant. What does that mean? I looked at, actually, it was at the AAO. He said, think about your clinic. So in your clinic, Mrs. Jones comes in as 20-20 vision, right? Next day she comes, next month she comes in, she's 20-25. You really going to care? Eh, not really. 20-30, eh. But at 20-40, three lines, you're going to think about it. Well, Mrs. Jones is in the same boat. 
She doesn't think the difference between 25 and 2020, she really notices. But when she gets to 2040, it's clinically meaningful for her. So these three line gainers, actually, and this, this translates to the quality of life studies, and she does more things when her vision's better, she does less things when her vision's worse. So that's why the 15 letter gainers are such a big deal. And the third thing is called area under the curve. Area under the curve is when, in reality, is basically what happens day to day to day and you average it over time. And what they do is they take all the measurements and they divide it by the number of visits and they come with this number of area under the curve. So this is the basic patient demographics. Nothing really sits out except for the concept that you've got 60% of patients were pseudophagic. The pressure was 15.2. These people are very swollen with 426 microns and the, and the visual acuity was 2080. From here, these patients have had diabetes for a long time. They had it for 15 years. More than half were type two. They were, you know, essentially they were they were reasonably well controlled and hemoglobin A1C of greater than eight. Um, what was interesting to know is that 93% of people had previous treatment before they got to Ozodex. So you got to remember, the, you know, it's not the first thing they treat. They probably got a bunch of anti-VEGF injections, and 35% got laser. So these are people that had been treated with lots of other therapies, and it wasn't working because if it was working, you wouldn't start Ozodex. So it turns out, what, in terms of the mean number of injections, were two injections a year, okay? So it was two injections a year, but almost 50%, 42% of people only need one injection a year. The average time between injections was 152 days. Dex was used as monotherapy in 99% of the cases. 45% did need some extra help, and they either got another intravitreal injection, usually, or they may have gotten laser, but typically the anti-VEGFs were the ones that Sinu just told you about, aflibercept, ranibizumab, or bevacizumab. In terms of visual acuity, they had nine letters between seven and nine letters. Now remember, when, I showed, when he showed you the visual acuity changes in the Mead study, they were significantly less than that. So basically there were nine letters that were given at the first one in 7.7, .7, and obviously it's a little more stacked to the first um, injection, because remember, 55% of people only needed one shot, right? Why would you give people another shot? Because your vision went down. So your average vision is going to be a little lower with subsequent injections, but they still are pretty close. In terms of OCT drying, you give more shots. Every time you give a shot, you dry the OCT. It's 125, 121, and 140. So it's all statistically significant. And you can see as you look at the number of shots, the number of patients go down because they don't need as many. So 36% of people had 15-letter gainers, which was actually higher than the Mead study. So in real life, we had more people doing it. The area under the curve was 3.7 letters, 3.6 letters. The mean best corrected visual acuity maximum change was 11.7 letters. So that's basically greater than two lines of vision. 137 microns was the mean maximum change in CRT. And 20% of people were considered you know, vision of better than 2040 and dry retinas. So basically, this would, they got driving vision back. So this is important to understand that in real life, patients did better than they did in the clinical trial. Obviously, IOP is something you worry about, and the IOP numbers were much less than they were in the clinical trial as well, because obviously, we, we were much better at screening people with essentially 12% of people having IOP over 25, 2.8, over 35, and 12.8, um, greater than 10, and 22% of people needed IOP medications. So as we look into real life, some of the things we saw in the clinical trial were worse, some actually were better, but the reality is that we have a, this is how you use it in real life. This is the adverse events, and you know, nothing really jumps out at you. So in conclusion, in real world practice, dex monotherapy and injunctive therapy improve best corrective visual acuity and central retinal thickness as well or better than the clinical trials that they were based on. There were no new safety questions going forward. And I do have to thank all the people that were involved in this because these are people that practiced in real life. So these were people that said, we're taking people out of our practice and showing what you know going forward. So this is one study. So I wanted to know, is it real? You know, you take, you look at studies and go, well, maybe you, you know, you had certain groups and maybe this group was good or bad or anything like that. So we ran a study and we did a literature search. We went and looked at all the phase four clinical trials I could find in a literature. This is slide one, by the way. Okay, you don't have, I'm not going through all the numbers. This is slide two, by the way. 
What you want to know, I looked at 19 clinical trials. Actually, my fellow looked at 19 clinical trials. And there were 874 patients that were studied. And the mean improvement in visual acuity was 9.25 letters. Basically, that was 50% higher than what you saw in Mead. And the mean OCT thickness decrease was 159 letters, which was also better. So in real life, this was my initial theory, sustained release steroids over do much better than their clinical trial counterparts. So, Senior did a great job telling you, we talked about Ozodex, we gotta talk about Alluvian. So the user study is a, is a phase four trial, similar to the phase four trial with reinforced. This is using Alluvian. It's a retrospective review, chart review of patients using Alluvian, and it was four centers. These were the people that did a lot of Alluvian. So you looked at 160 eyes. Patients had to receive Alluvian prior to January 1st, 2016 to be brought into this study. We wanted to see the correlation of DME treatments prior and after Alluvian administration. So they're looking at different things here. It's how many different times did you need shots or how many rescue shots did you need? What were the number? And then you want to see what are the IOP signals going forward now? Because again, the drug's now approved. In real life, how do people use it and what does it show? Here are your basic demographics. You basically should know that about 68% 68, 68 of people were pseudophagic, 22% were phagic. The, um, in terms of diabetes, um, you can see the numbers relatively similar, actually, to the reinforced data. Visual acuity, so this is interesting. So I need you to bring your, is there a pointer here? Right, okay. Okay, this is the dotted line. The dotted line is when people transition to alluvian, okay? So basically, you look at the vision. So people on Alluvian know they don't have this huge shoot up in vision. But the interesting thing, the vision remains stable. And this is an average over time. So initially their vision was 60. And when you use Alluvian, you're not using Alluvian to make your vision better. It's to decrease your treatment burden. So in the Alluvian patients, the number of treatments essentially, before they started Alluvian, they got a treatment every 2.9 months. After Alluvian, they needed a rescue treatment or another treatment 14.3 months. So this, its job is a sustained delivery mechanism and it did sustain delivery. Now the question is, we're gonna dig deeper. So when you dig deeper, people with better vision seem to need less treatments than people with vision isn't as good. So the, pigment, so the yellow line is basically people who have good vision. Essentially the vision is 20, 40 or better. They needed a treatment every 2.9, and one treatment every three months. Afterwards, they didn't need a treatment for 22 months. And again, you'd figure that out, right? Because people who see better don't have a lot of edema. They don't really need a whole lot of treatment. Now, the people whose vision was worse, worse than 2200, they still needed a treatment every three months, but, and their, they, didn't, they needed more rescue treatments, but guess what? Their vision went up. So basically, by using the Alluvian, their vision went up, their OCT swelling went down, they basically got better vision. Yeah, they weren't as good as people who didn't have a lot of swelling, but it still had value. The fact is the inflammatory response of the retina did well when exposed to a corticosteroid sustained release diluvian. So then we're going even deeper. So now we cut it, we're cutting the same data. We cut it in two parts, now we're cutting it in four parts. So the top and the bottom you've already seen, right? The ones in the middle are people who are essentially somewhere between 2100 and 2040. And that is the yellow line. That's the middle line over here. So essentially, you went from 3.2 months before to 15.2 months after. And then basically, looking at the people who were essentially um, 2,200 to 2,100, actually got worse over time with three months. And they got a little bit better, and they stabilized, and they needed treatment every seven months. So essentially, the sustained release therapies were able to decrease your treatment burden. And that was the goal of what you wanted to find out. And depending on where you started, showed you how much you needed and what would happen. So the question is, we look at additional treatments. 37% of people of the whole population needed additional treatments, and most of them got anti-VEGF. 15% got steroids and 10% got laser. But more than half people didn't need extra treatments. So Alluvian did work well, you know, in over 50% of people. Again, the sustained release therapy seems to have value and do what it's supposed to do, decrease your treatment burden. Well, obviously we look at retinal thickness. So you look at retinal thickness, this is the overall population. When you look at the overall population with the treatment every, you know, we showed you this before, one treatment every 3.2 months and then one treatment every 16.7 months. That with Alluvian, you have a decreased treatment burden, you also have decrease in your OCT thickness, as you can see over here in the yellow line. 
and that was statistically significant. When we look at people who, what I called people looking at the treatment of CST less than 300, okay, when dry, when you look at the dry population, they still needed a treatment every 3.2 months, and they needed a number of treatments 16.7 months, you can see over time that more and more people were, became dry using alluvian. And you can see the numbers are going up, that you had a higher percentage of people with dry using the steroid process. The concept of adding the steroid dried their retina up, and yet more people that were dry, more people have dry, have more stable vision. Obviously, we've got to talk about pressure, steroids, and turns out on the intraocular pressure and the overall population, it didn't budge. Essentially, here's what you had before. You add the steroid, no big difference. Now, we want to look at this. So we look at before alluvium, we look, break it down into pieces. IOP over 21, before alluvium, they were 38%. After, it was 30%. IOP over 25, it was 15% before and 15% after. IOP over 30, it was 5% and 5%. Trabeculoplasty, it was three before, okay, and through two after, so 1.9 to 1.3. Trabeculotomy, zero. There was zero before. If you use the alluvian based on its, the way it's been indicated by the FDA, you don't have any people who need a trabeculectomy. And, it, and in terms of other incisional surgery, the numbers are identical, 1.3 and 1.3. All the p-values are not significant, which means after you started alluvian, your pressure problems didn't significantly change, which is important to know. When you pre-screen the people, just like Sinu told you, you end up in a much better shape, having more control of the IOP issues as well as better control of swelling and vision. In terms of medications, beforehand, essentially you needed 17.5% of patients needed IOP medicine, afterwards 24% needed, and the difference was not statistically significant. So you didn't have a lot more IOP medicines when you screened appropriately. So in summary, the majority of patients improved anatomic and functional outcome treated with alluvian. There was a significant reduction in number of treatments needed to maintain and improve vision. Patients with better visual acuity at the time of alluvian administration had the better, the better benefits, and the risk of steroids is mitigated when you use the, when you follow the label, you run into less trouble. So let's talk about safety, because we spent a lot of time about talking about safety. Whenever you usually give a talk on anti-VEGF, and everybody at this podium has given lots of talks on anti-VEGF, 30% of the time we talk about, it, about safety. So I wanted to hit the safety in one fell swoop, so we're doing that as we speak. So this is the table of most of the major studies that were done in terms of DME and safety. So the highest thing of anti, you know, APTC events, which are thromboembolic events, the highest number there was on the left was protocol I. And that was the control group view. So understanding when you think about safety, the, the worst thing is actually the people who are in control. Now obviously protocol T, there was a, you know, one that jumped up to be 12%, but essentially it's about five to 6%, anywhere from like five to seven or 8%. We're talking about APTC events. And these are people who are diabetic, right? So they've got diabetic issues going forward. We talk about steroids. What's the safety thing that you worry about? You worry about cataract surgery. 61% of patients had cataract surgery during MEAD. 81% had surgery during FAME. IOP. When we talk about IOP, essentially, you can see the difference. MEAD and FAME. 28% had IOP greater than 10 in me, 34% IOP greater in FAME. As Sinu told you, it was a much higher rate of incisional surgery in FAME than me, 5 versus 0 0.3. And then basically medication treatment is pretty similar with 42 and, 30, 42 and 31%, or 41 and 31%. So the question is, we talked about real life, so I got cut off a little bit. So I, I actually surveyed your patients. What we did was we went and ran a compliance study to show between wet AMD and DME. So what we did was we looked at we met a survey, and we sent it to 1,726 retina specialists. Now, you may have, some of you who didn't get it may have gone in your spam, or you may have been something that you didn't believe me. But I wanted to know in the old days, we're going to talk ICD-9, it's an old school, 362.52, which was the injection code for wet AMD, and 36207 was for DME. And basically, we wanted to look at your electronic medical record data to figure out how many patients canceled and no-showed. Now, understanding a cancellation means Mrs. Jones calls you up and says, I can't come to see you, Dr. Kiss. And basically, Dr. Kiss's staff is going to, not going to let you off that telephone until you make another appointment. No show means they kind of blew you off. So what we went, we had 87,000 patients were analyzed from 39 practices, 49,000, about 50 grand for 
wet AMD and 37,000s for DME. We then looked at the concept, and what we found was 13.5% canceled and 3.27% were no-shows, and then that was for your AMD patients. And then for your DMA, 14.32 canceled and 10% were no-shows. So if you look at your odds ratio, the chance of DME patients not showing compared to AMD was 3.296. What that means is three times more likely to no-show you than cancel on you. So basically, that's interesting to know. Well, that was the U.S. So we wanted to say, well, it's the U.S. So, 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 so basically, the patients have other places to be, but they also pay co-pays. Maybe it's the money, right? Everybody says how tough you hear all about that. It's the money. So I said, Let's, why don't we go to Europe? So here's the American data, graphically put. So we go to Europe, and we surveyed Europe, and it was 22,000 patients. 20,000 were wet AMD, and 1,600 were DME, a little smaller, but still a lot of people. And it turns out 14.47 pay percent canceled and 183, 1.83 were no-shows. And for DME, 15.9 percent were cancellation and 12 percent were no-shows. So essentially, look at the difference in no-shows. The odds ratio was 7.3, almost over double the cancellation rates for DME versus AMD versus the United States. So I think this is interesting to look. This is the cancellation rates for the EU. And basically, the cancellation rates were higher anywhere in the globe with DME more than AMD. They don't show up. They are more likely to cancel. Um, DME are more likely to cancel than your AMD patients and much more likely to no-show. So whether it's in the United States or in Europe, they're doing that. What are the reasons? Well, obviously, um, these are the graphs again so you, get, you can remember. And essentially, DME patients are working age. They've got other places to be. Dr. Kiss has done a lot of work showing that basically the average number of doctor visits with people with DME, every doctor, it's 25 visits a year. Now, last I checked, most of us are only open business hours. That's over a month, and they got a job, right? They, this is the comorbidities. They also suffer from poor compliance because how did they get DME to begin with? They had Their hemoglobin A1C was probably higher than it should be. And obviously, wet AMD, the vision is immediate and devastating. So basically... Charlie did a great job saying there are people who've got swelling on the ROCT, and a lot of us said we'd, we'd tolerate some of that swelling. In wet AMD, there's no way any of us would tolerate the swelling because we know how devastating and how quickly devastating wet AMD is, and vision loss with DME can go be much slower. And the question would be, do you take something for granted if it's paid for? That's what my daughter taught me. If, you don't pay, if, you know, if, you, if the health club membership was free, you might go a little less than if you had to pay for it. Okay, um, and this is where combination therapy works. If you're not going to show up, right, it's better to have something that works while you're not there. So again, combination therapy is good for about four months or more, and it keeps people dry. So essentially, what we're going to do now, and I want to thank these, I mean, these were a lot, I want to thank all the people that were part of the survey, because it was, I could not have done it without them. We're going to take a moment, and before we go to post those questions, we've, you've all,